Alex, I still find that mad. What? You don't know the thug that that tastes like promotion. Never seen it before in my life. George knows that, surely. George, have you seen a meme of thug that when he goes, that tastes like promotion? Why are oh, you on mute? He's on mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh my oh, God. Take your mute off. <laughs> Can't even hear him. What, what Technical is, difficulties what, at the kind of pod. He's back. What is a thug dad? <laughs> what is a thug dad? I don't know what that is either. <sighs> Isn't there a person named Thogden? I've heard of Thogden. I had heard of Thogden and I knew no, he had a dad. So but I dad. You don't know who Thog dad is. Like, okay, this is. Isn't, this wasn't is there crazy. some situation with the mum? Thog mum? I don't know the situation. So, well, that's, do that's you call the moment, your parents Thog. Bav mum and Bav, mom and bav dad? <laughs> I don't call my mum mum of 14, no. So that's, but, what, that's what this stands for, yeah, right? Thug it's mom. a Thog. Yeah, it's, the, yeah. no, it's the Thog dad. Uh, Anyways, guys, welcome back to the Candle Podcast, and we're here after a sensational victory against Brentford. Last minute scenes as Kai Havertz headed home a late winner, and Arsenal are back top of the Premier League with ten games left. Lads, how are we doing? We're great. We are. We are. We are here, ready to indulge in this beautiful eight-game winning streak that has bettered last season's best Premier League run. Um, difficult game, I think, in general, but I actually think it was a brilliant uh, precursor to Porto. Um, and there was a lot of things that I felt we did well against a very stubborn block that, um, look, whenever you have a, a back line, that's all out. But yeah, so I, I think that um, in general, just I, I saw a lot of really great qualities from, from the boys in terms of beating down not just a low block, but a mid block that I think was very well structured, very well defended. And for all of the talk about Brentford's back line being out, I don't think you would have seen it because the spaces were compact. They were, um, you know, I, I don't think that this was a poor arsenal against a poor Brentford. I thought that this was a good team that defended well. And um, we took our chances. And uh, the, the early dominance I felt carried well into the second half, um, bar a really poor mistake by Aaron. Um, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, on a topic. But I think in general, the boys did very well. I think we missed Jorginho's presence once he came off the pitch. I thought that, you know, he was really important to making sure that we were having a tempo that allowed us to access the final third a little bit quicker. And I think once he got off, it was a little bit more difficult for us to gain rhythm. But some pretty nice cameos in general. I, I liked the minutes that I saw from Gabriel Jesus. I liked the minutes I saw from Reese Nelson. And um, there was a couple just really solid um, I think defensive performances, uh, namely Ben White, who for me was man of the match. I thought he was absolutely brilliant. He has been brilliant for a while. And I hope we do a section on Ben White because there was a big narrative when for me, he was quite clearly injured in the fall. And um, I don't think that this form is a surprise. When he is fit, is there a better, more complete right back in the Premier League for the job that he does for us? Um, and not even just for us, like in general, is there a more rounded fullback in the league? That I'm not too sure of. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good question to ask, obviously, Alex. Where, where do you think Ben White currently ranks as in, in the best right backs in the league? You've got Walker, Trent's currently injured, you know, and uh, maybe you, you could say right now Liverpool's Conor Bradley. Where does Ben White rank in current form of, of right backs in the league? I think that interview you did came up again today about how in our tech system you have to be a 10, you have to be a centre-back, you have to be a full-back, you have to be a winger, you have to be you have to be everything. I think partly because of that, I, I, do you know what, I, I liken him to Nathan Ake and I appreciate Ake made the mistake at the weekend, but he's been he's been City's, arguably City's best defender all season. But he won't get in the team of the season. I think it's unlikely or, or certainly if he does, it'll be, you know, oh, Ake's in the team of the season. He will never get the praise he, des he deserves. And it's because of this thing that I've spoken about before, so forgive me if you've heard me say it, but I think people are used to a traditional fullback. They know what that is. That's Pablo Zabaleta, Gary Neville, arguably Carl Walker is the kind of the perfect version of that. You can get up and down, you overlap, you, 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 you know, Carl Walker doesn't do this much anymore, but used to be you whip the cross in, you know, all that sort of stuff. We have sort of have that in our mind. And we now know what an inverted fullback is. You know, people might not, like it and people might still say oh you know Pep trying to reinvent the wheel and actually Pep's just doing things that have been done before but in a very good way um so we know what that is we you know it's Cancelo it's Inchenko it's it's Trent it's you know a different type of fullback but George was right Ben White is so complete and can do so many different things in a game that he's never going to be going up and down and you know you see remember that Chambers game Mm -hmm. where he was clearly instructed to to be to go up and down and be Cafu and he gets the the plaudits of the you know Chambers was like was like Cafu today because White fulfills exactly West Ham away because White fulfills so many different roles within one game 
you can't quite get your eyes adjusted unless you're just watching him. I think I I completely agree with George. I think he's been arguably, um, yeah, I, I think he's been arguably the best best fullback in the league, uh, certainly since Dubai. Um, I, I, maybe I would say he he has been, and I I, I think it's yeah, it, it, he probably won't ever get the plaudits, but in a way, maybe that's okay. And you know, I, I, that's the reason I think is 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 the reason I said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very important, of course, that he gets those plaudits eventually. But George, Arsenal had a tough game. Because, you know, Alex m mentioned before the game, tweeted out, you know, ironically, we're going to cook because Brentford have their back four missing. But we did not cook in terms of like we did against Sheffield and the likes of them. It was a difficult game, tough but a block to break down. So how did Arsenal get through eventually? Um, look, I, I think that uh, we, we struggled to find the same dynamism off the left. Um, that was pretty clear for quite a while. And I, and I don't think that Bukayo Saka had much joy either throughout the match. Like, I don't think he was poor. But I think Brentford did a brilliant job about blocking the space out wide and blocking the entry pass into our wingers early because they know that as soon as you're able to block that pass, Arsenal struggle to penetrate through the middle. And I think that's what was happening quite a bit where the first ball out wide was really well defended, um, really well blocked and really well uh, marshaled out. And so there was this kind of emphasis on Arsenal to um, try to break through the middle but not go over the top because they were quite deep. So the ball over the top wasn't really on because it was a little bit deeper than just the normal mid block that we were facing. So um, it, it kind of put the onus to go through us. We couldn't go around them. We couldn't go over the top of them and going through them proved to be a little bit more difficult for us. I felt we missed a couple more interchanges and quality between the lines where we could really um, kind of exploit their pivot um, and their midfield pivot. I thought that, you know, defending wise, when you defend with people that aren't in your back line, you want to keep those distances small, distances tight. And that's really the benefit and really the found, founding kind of bedrock of any defensive shape. You know, tight lines between the midfield, between the defensive line. Don't 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 kind of make sure that, you know, your your full back is farther up and committing man to man and you're not supporting it. So they were just very well drilled. And I thought Arsenal Arsenal struggled with that a little bit. But I, I mean struggled is a, is a loose term because I don't know about you guys, but I had to look through that first half and I just felt like Arsenal dominated and the goal was coming. And, you know, the goal next to Declan Rice really was a culmination of some beautiful play that we had really been knocking on the door of Brentford for quite a while. And um, if if you could almost remove the goal from your memory, because it's a poor goal, and it's a poor goal to concede. And I think that taints the memory about what the first half really looked like, at least for me as a story, because such an easy goal to concede, you're left frustrated and you're left there at a break when really you should have been well out of sight, two or three nil up. And I, I, that's the feeling I got at a first half. And then I think the, the one thing that I'll say about the second half in general is I felt like, again, our tempo kind of went with Jorginho off and out of the team. And I think that um, the, the speed to which we build up is just as important as having the variety. So when we talk about the, the, the differences between Raya and Ramsdale and what the benefits they give us in build up, one of the biggest things that I really enjoyed was with Raya and the team, there's a quicker build-up tempo, I find, than there is with Aaron. And Aaron tends to go long because he's not as comfortable receiving in the back line as David Raya is. And so it's not just receiving, though. It's it's that first touch. I find Aaron is quite square to his marker. So if he's receiving a pass off the left, his shoulders are facing the left, whereas David Raya kind of opens his body so that his body is facing the pitch. And so in that same way, in the same touch that he kind of controls the first pass, he's able to open up out wide, whereas Aaron is having multiple touches to open out. And just that extra touch, that extra delay is what kind of delays our buildup, ironically, a little bit farther up. So I just think it's a knock-on effect that we really struggle to kind of really maintain because, again, Brentford had a really stubborn, good, well-disciplined low block that they were uh, focused on making sure not to concede territory. I think Thomas Frank's a brilliant coach, and I think a lot of this has to go down to him because look at their form, guys. It's it's poor in results, but have a look at their injuries. It's actually quite ridiculous. I don't know if there's a more injured team to the starting 11, bar maybe Brighton, maybe. And um, and so, it, look, it was a tough game. I, I still maintain we could have done a little bit better in terms of our tempo, maybe pro progress kind of through the center of the pitch a little bit quicker, more incisively, be a little bit more brave between the lines. But uh, as a whole, I thought that Arsenal dominated, and I really wasn't worried um, watching that match personally. I know that we tied, but I was like, okay, really annoying goal to concede, but you know the boys are on top, and I didn't see any complacency in terms of our patterns. So, so yeah. 
Yeah, it was one of those games where Arsenal had to find a way and we did in the first half with a superb header from Declan Rice. And Alex, there's a question around the Arsenal fan base right now, seeing how natural Rice is playing as a number eight. But he's thriving, he's scoring goals now, 12 goals and assists. We often compare him to Rodri. But now you've got names like Yaya Toure that was mentioned by Thierry Henry. Where do you see Rice's evolution next? Is it one where he actually could make that number eight role his own? Babs, you know me now. What do you think I'm going to say? I think there's yeah it's yes. it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, it's dependent it's dependent and you know it's, sorry to sound like a, a broken record but we can I ask a different question because you're gonna go off go on, on go how on. there's no starting elevens and you know there you're gonna annoy Babs but I have a question not so actually not oh, so okay but go carry on. on carry on then sorry well, no no, no go, go do the question do the question okay go. so the the question I had is why do fans believe that an anchor or six quote end quote can't um, join the attack. Why? Why is there this still this almost? Uh, I don't want to be rude, but this prehistoric assumption that sitters or sixes anchor, period. And because because we've seen we've seen it where I think people just say, oh, because Declan Rice is playing the eight, he's box crashing more, his runs are more anticipated. But really, when we dominate play, guys, everybody has seen that screenshot of Sheffield where we're camped in their half and the entire 10 is in our half. So like naturally, we're going to find situations where our anchor is going to be between the boxes and in and around the 18-yard box because of how dominant we are. I mean, we quote field tilt as a little bit of a running joke, but have a look at it. What does that mean? It means you're camped out in your opposition's final third. So uh, I don't know. I, I guess for you guys, it doesn't matter where he starts, where he ends, because in this system, it's positionless. I would say his role does kind of change though when he plays as a six. It is more in terms of keeping the ball moving, whereas playing as an eight, he, he seems to be really more a, a bit more aggressive inside the box, and he's got some very good instinctive movements. And you then think about why Pep wanted to sign him, and with Gundogan leaving, was it like a replacement there and there? It looks like he's got these attacking, he's got this desire to score goals, and I think part of it's to prove himself as why he's worth 100 million pounds. People can see the tackles and the passes, but if you can score goals on top of that, then it becomes even more obvious and abundant. And I think that's why Austin Vans are talking about going, look, this guy is really natural as a number eight, and he's growing game by game, and he's not played that much either in his, in his entire career. He's now got 12 goals and assists, his most ever in a Premier League history for him. So, what do you reckon, what, what do you reckon Mr. Moneypenny? There was an interview with Pep this week, which I thought was really great. And he talked about, um, I think with Sky, I think it was like the, they did this kind of the same interview eight years apart. It was really good to go check it out. But um, he was talking about so much of it is what your players, you know, the play, he was being very clear, the players teach you. Yes, you have your ideas and your principles and the way you want to play. But in the end, the players teach you something. I've spoken before about, he says about John Stones. You know, we talk about the John Stones role. Yes, of course, Pep has facilitated that. That's his job to do that. But equally, John Stones' unique qualities have allowed that John Stones role to grow. The John Stones role doesn't work with Nathan Ake. The John Stones, you know, that's that's kind of the point of it. So I think we look at Declan Rice, and I think what I was going to talk about really was the fact that was was really to praise Mikel for eking out these qualities, these latent qualities that were within Declan Rice already and weren't being seen at, at West Ham. And I'll point you back to, I can't remember who it's against, but it was in the Europa League, maybe semi-final or quarter-final where Declan Rice scores and he runs basically the whole length of the pitch. That's a striker's finish. And actually, if you watch him in this game, there is a a, a, a sort of a, what's the word, a poacher-ish sort of movement around the box. He's almost joining the attack as like a second 10 alongside Havertz at points. He was sort of like a dual 10. In the end, we are in a positionless system. And you know, I, I, I know... I say, you know, well, positions don't matter. Positions are useful. It's useful as a sort of a, a base starting point to say he's a six, he's an eight, whatever, that sort of stuff. But the reason I shy away from it is because it doesn't help us to analyse him. It actually limits what we see him doing, I think, which is why I shy away from it. I shy away from it as a position, because as a, as a label, because I think once you say, well, Rice is playing in the eight, people will go, oh yeah, well, Rice had a great game. He was getting forward. No, no, Rice was also one of the most key cogs in our defensive performance. This is an all-round midfield performance. Like we can't, you know, apply one one sort of... The reason I, I get annoyed about it is because we apply one position and then limit what someone can do, what the eight can do in, in our Teta system. In the end, it comes back to what Pep said. It comes back to the composition of the players in our team. How does Erdegaard link with Rice? How does Rice link with Erdegaard? How do Havertz and Rice play off one another? How could that, what could that mean for a Havertz and a number nine, as we've spoken about before, again, you know, using the positional uh, label there. 
it all for me means that there is a there, there was a latent quality in Declan Rice that Mikel has allowed to flourish. In the same interview, Pat talks about Jeremy Doku. And he says, my job is not to... Is to he asked the interviewer, what's Jeremy Doku's best quality? And the interviewer sort of says, I think he's dribbling. He says, yeah, dribbling, right. So my job as a manager is to look at Jeremy Doku and say, how can I get him in as many positions as possible to, ex to excel there? Credit to Mikel, because what he's done with Declan Rice is said... I'm not going to limit your role. I'm not going to call you a six. I'm not going to call you an eight. I'm going to say, how do you link with Martin Erdegaard, with Jorginho, as we've seen in that sort of double pivot, the, the two of them together, and what that means for the team? But also, how can I get you into positions where you can thrive? And we're seeing that. And that's developed over the course of the season. So I, I really wanted to praise Mikel because it's it's allowing the players to teach you is, is, is what I've been impressed by. Mm -hmm. And another example of that is the Arsenal attack. We've now scored 70 goals, the second highest in Europe, only behind Bayern Munich, the highest in the Premier League, all without uh, a striker. You know, no, no Osimena, no Haaland, no Salah. We've got Kai Havertz instead, and he, and he looks like he's found his role. So let's talk Kai Havertz, George, because Havertz scoring another important goal in this game now makes it eight goals for the season. I think even in terms of his goal scoring numbers, he's slightly overperforming his XG. He's, he's had got, got a 20% goal conversion rate. It looks like he's finding his boots again in front of goal, and it seems like he's less a bad finisher and more confidence based because even his days are by Leverkusen, and he always had he was always overperforming his XG. Apart from Chelsea, of course, which is, of course maybe his confidence is lower. I think that uh, he he's always had really good ball striking. I don't think that there's ever been a question mark about the technique or kind of his ability to finish from a shooting perspective. It's always been situational. It's always been he's clean through on goal and is he making the right decision about slotting it to the far right, about whether or not he's chipping the keeper and about some of the decision making on his finishing has always been the question, I think, even as far back as Chelsea. Like when you're looking at about analyzing his time in England, about being a quote unquote poor finisher. I don't think it's ever been because of a lack of ability, a variety of finishes, or even his intelligence. It's just making the right decision in the moment. And I think that comes with confidence. I think when you're feeling good, you're feeling free, you're not doubting or second guessing, you know, kind of your decisions. And that's really key in the box. And I just think that for him still, he, he he's just, he, he's putting himself in situations that he's maximized and the team is recognizing that. And so when you look at this passage of play, by the way, I don't think Kai Havertz has been, um, despite being a really good aerial target, he hasn't scored very many aerial goals. And, you know, I think it's just about this team being able to put him in situations where he's able to thrive and attack the box because um, as soon as you're aggressive with intent, these things come. And, you know, that I, I just think that Kai Havertz is taking steps. It's taking steps on not just his rehabilitation. I think he's doing steps in terms of changing the perception about maybe what Arsenal might be looking to achieve with him down the line. Because I think he's just more than just an over-the-top type of player. The, the the ability to ghost into the box only really matters if you're able to finish those ghostings. And I think he's proving it. I think he's done um, a really, really good job always about finding space. Um, and I just think a lot of times it's Arsenal uh, trying to get used to this type of striker. Because Kai Havertz is a very different type of striker to Jesus to Trossard, to Lacazette. If you actually think about it, the type of striker that Arsenal have played with for years now has been that come to. And of course we had Aubameyang, and of course we had that for a period, but really Aubameyang was shifted out to the left wing as far as Mikel Arteta was concerned. And I think the type of striker, when you talk about Babs playing a different way with Arsenal, I also think Arsenal have to remember kind of to play with a different type of striker, period. Not just in terms of the fans, but in terms of what we're evaluating here. Because you start to look at your your Hollands, your Nunezes, and all those channel runners in kind of the world. I don't think they're the most... Look, Holland, I think, is a, is, a, is a particular exception along with Mbappe and whatnot. But you look at your Nunezes, you look at, um, you know, your Hoylands. They're not the one-shot bang conversion types. They are the people that, you know, will make the run, will create the chaos, create the doubt in the back line, and they may finish one of three. And and I do think, to be fair, even in this goal-scoring run, that still describes Havertz. I still think there's been times that he could do better with his efficiency, you know, but at the end of the day, that doesn't matter because he's continuously creating doubt in the back line. And what it does is when you've got a player that's able to physically compete and run beyond you and receive deep as a defender, do I stick? Do I go? that doubt is really what creates the space for other people. And I think that's been the key. Look, it's a brilliant finish. And I think most of it for me goes down to Ben White, brilliant cross. The crossing variety was 
on show once again. And the pace, it really meant that all you had to do is get it on target. I don't think that anybody misses that. That, that. that kind of is due to the cross. But for me, that goal was coming for Kai because of the doubt that he created all match in terms of the, in terms of the back line. And that was credit to him. Mm-hmm. And it, it was fantastic, of course. And now he has eight goals. He's matched his best of a, a, Ch- a tally at Chelsea mm-hmm. with 10 games to spare. So we'll see how that goes there. But we have to talk about the goalkeeping t- uh, incident. Aaron Ramsdale and goal. Paul Aaron Ramsdale making a mistake. And do you know what I find so funny is he still ends the game doing that to the Brentford fans. And some people will say, you're not helping yourself. But he's done it. And it, look, Arsenal won the game, which is the most important thing. But Alex, talk to me about Ramsdale. What were your thoughts straight after that goal goes in? Thanks for checking out the Canon Podcast. To hear the full episode, sign up as a YouTube member on this channel or go to patreon.com forward slash the Canon Pod.